Our first case of a novel coronavirus confirmed in a person here in British Columbia. It's coronavirus, it's been on our minds for well over a year now. Sustainability is conceptualized in multiple dimensions, such as environmental, social, and economic. When it comes to climate change and sustainability, where are we now and where might we end up? Today, I'm asking our faculty about our future after COVID. In terms of thinking about sustainability and the work that I do, it might be surprising for people to know as a health services researcher that this is actually a concept that's important to me. Oftentimes we're thinking about things like planetary health when we think about sustainability or the environment, but health services and health systems are actually part of the everyday environment that we live our social lives within. Greenhouse gas reduction is a global public good. It means it's a global collective action problem and you need everybody acting. And that's really hard. People with disabilities suddenly have found that their usual access routes have been, have been blocked by cafes and other, other uses. We don't resource the reduction of vulnerability. We resource reactions to devastation. Twenty twenty was a big year for social justice movements. Yeah, I think that there is a lot of hope in our society because at the same time that we've been experiencing this, we have been experiencing other, you know, issues and and progress around around key issues. So I mean, I think that you know everything that happened with George Floyd and Black Lives Matter at the same time that the COVID pandemic was starting. It's been very important, I think, for our society to to reckon more with with these issues and, and to and I think that it is, you know, mapped on that, like, say, black businesses in Vancouver are not only facing, you know, institutionalized racism, but they're also facing, you know, COVID impacts. And so, you know, I think to, you know, what gives me hope is that we're seeing the interconnections with justice and progress and, you know, justice and economic stability. And so I'm hoping that as we come out of COVID, we will recognize that we need, you know, better planning for disruption. We need to better reduce vulnerability, et cetera. Black, black Urban Slate, there's a Canadian planner called uh, Jay Pitter, for example. Um, another one called Amina Yazin. Um, she wrote a paper, a very good paper, with, with another planner called Daniela Ferguson. Um, and there's others in other parts of the world too, who, who all turn, turn around to that statement about, about public space being good for everyone in the current context and say, well, actually, the same, um, the, the same regimes of policing and surveillance and, and, and uh, differentiation among people in terms of their, their, their race, their class and so on, they, those are all still there, and if we don't if we don't address those deeper um, structural inequalities, then maybe changing the the design of a particular public space won't really um, improve society that much. Am I cynical at the same time? Yes, you know, and I think that you know when you look at municipalities, especially, um, you know, they're kind of skittish about some of these issues. They don't necessarily want to stick themselves in the middle of it um, and necessarily lead and push, you know, they're going to be really responsive to how voters act and how the culture sort of changes and adapts. And so, um, you know, I think I'm hopeful, but, uh, but I'm concerned that we don't have enough leadership in this space. I think the protests after, after George Floyd's death uh, or murder, um, are probably related in some ways to, to the fact that people were paying more attention for sustained periods of time, partly because, because other things that might have attracted attention um, weren't, weren't there in the same way. And, and people, people really focused on that and it really highlighted a set of injustices, which of course have been there for, for much longer. Um, I think the, char the character of these movements often fluctuates over time. So the, 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 the being out in the street thing um, happens for a certain amount of time, but then the, the movements will often uh, sort of step back into more protected spaces as, the, as they work out next steps and so on. Other movements though are, are clearly related to COVID. So, so you, could, you, you can see over the last year, there has been a real push in many places for, uh, for new forms of mutual aid to be, um, to be uh, 
operationalize within cities. So, so providing providing free food, providing food to vulnerable populations, for example, is, has been a big one. And then, of course, related to that have been um, have been demands for things like uh, um, moratoriums on evictions, or uh, more more radically still. Uh, the the abolition the abolition of rent and and private privatized housing and and so on um, the, these kind of these kind of things also also um, basic income uh, these these are all things that have all existed for a long time before um, both as ideas for making the world better and also as critiques of what's wrong with it, with cities at the moment but the um, the crisis, I think, um, has catalyzed them and also also combined them in interesting ways. I first started in the area of dis critical disability studies, looking at employment and um, healthcare experiences among those with contested chronic illnesses. And one thing I know in terms of uh, workplace or work workforce accommodations is that for many people, it's a very siloed approach that can take a very extended period of negotiation in order to do things like get approval to work from home. And now here I am working from my house with no long term approvals that were sought in order to do so. And so, again, there are many disability advocates who have said that in the last year, we have made leaps and bounds forward that we would like to figure out ways to retain once we're in a post-COVID society. So these are some of the kinds of things that are on my mind in terms of seeing how approaches that we've undertaken to address immediate issues as a result of the transformations that we've seen throughout the course of the pandemic have actually resulted in positive changes that we would like to see implemented in the long term.